Welcome to the America's 360 podcast. Get the inside scoop and the outside perspective on the latest developments from Canada, Latin America, and everywhere in between. America's 360 is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Hello and welcome back to another episode of America's 360. I'm your host, John Molesky. This program is brought to you by the world's number one think tank for regional studies, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And America's 360 is a collaboration among the center's Argentina Project, Brazil Institute, Canada Institute, Latin American Program, and Mexico Institute. Well, with the region struggling to tame rising fuel costs, high inflation, and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, citizens in many nations across the Americas are also heading to the polls. And the circumstances I just mentioned are the types of things that usually result in a restless electorate looking for change. We've seen a variety of outcomes. Colombians recently elected Gustavo Petro as their first leftist president in modern history. In Mexico, AMLO's Marina Party won four of six governorships up for grabs in the June elections. And recent polls show former Brazilian President Lula with a double-digit lead over incumbent President Bolsonaro ahead of Brazil's October presidential election. There's lots to sort out, but we have the panel to do just that. Today, we'll ask our experts to analyze how current economic conditions are affecting voter preferences across the Americas and what this changing political landscape means for the U.S., the region, and the world. So please say hello to Wilson Center Distinguished Fellow, Cindy Arnson. Hello, John. Hey, Cindy. Latin American Program Acting Director, Benjamin Gadan. Greetings, John. Greetings, Benjamin. Good to see you. Canada Institute Director, Christopher Sands. Bonjour. Hi, John. Hey, Chris. And making her America's 360 debut, Mexico Institute Deputy Director Leela Abed. Leela, welcome. Thanks for joining us. John, great to be here. So uh, let's um, let's start out, Cindy, if we could, with you talking about uh, an election in Colombia, which has invoked terms like historic and all kinds of, of things. What happened? Why is it so significant? Well, it is a historic election. This is the first time in Colombian history, basically, that a person of the left has made it all the way to the presidency. This was the third attempt by Gustavo Petro. um, And he, uh, in the last weeks of the campaign, faced a really kind of surprising and, and also unprecedented challenge from someone who was really unknown in national politics, Rodolfo Hernandez, who had a single theme of his campaign, anti-corruption, and who just took off and bumped the traditional party's um, you know, front runner, the person who everyone thought would go into this second round, just knocked him out of the running. Um, and the reason I think, um, and poll after poll has shown this, not only international polls, but also domestic Colombian polls, people are just fed up with the status quo with the traditional elites. They have suffered so many reversals, economic reversals, social reversals in one of Latin America's most unequal countries. And I think it was the um, uh, the, the added weight of the pandemic on top of grievances that had been accumulating for a long time. And we saw in the protests at in uh, late 2019, that just caused an overflowing cup, and it was sort of anybody but a face that we know. Yeah, you know, I guess uh, the one party you don't want to be associated with is status quo these days. It seems as if that is a losing proposition. uh, uh, Benjamin, if I could turn to you, if we rewind the tape to an election in March and Gabriel Boric in Chile, and what you could tell us about that, and if we are starting to detect a pattern, you know, we've we've spent a lot of time on this program talking about the rise of populism, not just in the Americas, but globally. And I wonder, can we start to connect the dots in a way where we see a pattern emerging? I think there's a lot of people connecting those dots, John. You now have had leftists win elections in Chile, as you mentioned, including in a coalition that involves the Communist Party. You've had Gustavo Petro win in Colombia, of all places. You have leftists governing Bolivia right now, governing Peru, governing Honduras after many years of the conservative National Party governing there. Um, So you have the makings of what appears to be an ideological shift in the region. Um, I might argue, actually, though, that the bigger factor is what Cindy has alluded to, which is a general 
generalized discontent throughout Latin America. Um, and I think you see that because when some of these leftists do take office, they have very short honeymoons. They often perform poorly in the midterm elections that occurred in Mexico and in Argentina in recent years. Um, you know, heavy is the head that wears the crown. That's always true. Right now, it's just an impossible task. Yeah. Alila, now, when we look at results in Mexico, we see some contradictory outcomes, right? Incumbents losing, but losing to people who represent the ruling party. Uh, How do you uh, uh, make sense of this? That's right, John. And I think what Benjamin just said that, you know, populists, especially leftist leaders tend to have a short honeymoon period. In Mexico, AMLO's approval rates just keep continue to grow. And the Morena, the governing party, um, has solidified really its its governing power in, in these past elections. Um, Morena flipped the governorship in Hidalgo, Oaxaca, Quintana Roo, and Tamaulipas, which ultimately means that the Morena-led coalition now governs 22 of Mexico's 32 states, which ultimately shows that it, you know, it controls more than 60% of the country. And I think the overwhelming support for Morena demonstrates the continuing voter rejection of traditional parties, but also an enthusiasm for um, the president and his political agenda. But the the most interesting part to me, John, is that things don't look great in Mexico. I'm going to throw up some numbers for our audience, so bear with me a little bit. But the Mexican economy shrank 4.5% in 2022 as a pandemic, you know, hit factories, businesses, households. Um, It was the worst contraction, really, since the 1994 tequila crisis. Um, And the Mexican economy is really only expected to grow around 2% this year. Um, Insecurity uh, rates have spiked more than 100,000 homicides in the first three years of the AMLO government. Twelve journalists have been assassinated so far in 2022. Femicides have increased substantially. And according to INEGI, poverty has increased from 43.2% in 2016 to 43.9% in 2020. So despite the economic, security, social challenges that persist in Mexico and have honestly worsened in many instances under the current administration, it seems that voters do not blame AMLO for the shortcomings. Um, so, in, in a, you know, to answer your, your question, Mexico sort of seems to be an outlier in the sense that AMLO really just remains extremely popular. His approval rates around 54 to 58 percent. Um, and that's really not then it's not really surprising that Morena captured the majority of the governorships. And if we think about it, Morena is AMLO and AMLO is Morena. Mexican citizens are voting for the president, not for a political party. So as long as AMLO continues to be the sole unifying factor within Morena, and as long as he maintains high levels of support, Morena will continue to win election. And I would just end on one note and what this really means for Mexico's democracy going forward. It is quite interesting, John, in my opinion, because Morena is establishing itself as a single party state with power concentrated in one person. Similar to kind of what happened during the 71 year year rule, excuse me, of the PRI, which AMLO ironically despises and blames for most of Mexico's problems. So, again, I think AMLO is an outlier in that he seems to be immune from criticism, but it also comes at the detriment of the country's democracy and economic well-being. Back to you, John. Lilo, a quick a quick follow up on that sixty six percent control by Morena. Uh, historically, is that usual, unusual for one party to have so much domination? It is unusual at the governorship level, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in the Congress, Morena doesn't have the two thirds majority it needs to pass it, the constitutional reforms that AMLO is still hoping to get approved in the in the last three years of its administration. Um, so he's really had to pull. Um, support from different political parties to get some of his political agenda um, ahead and to get it approved. So I think that with the with the support that he now has at the state level, which is more than the 17 uh, local legislatures that it needs to approve constitutional reforms, those are not going to get approved because he doesn't have uh, an overwhelming majority in Congress. So there is still that balance, you know, of um, power uh, in in, in terms of the legislative branch and the executive branch, but on a, on, on a state level, I mean, Morena is just, uh, has positioned itself as the sole governing party. And I think that's where we're heading towards the 2024 elections, the presidential elections. Okay. Uh, Chris, uh, you know, before we, we all got together on the air, we had some 
back and forth off the air. And you, and you raise an interesting question about, you know, in attempting to understand these elections, are these just part of the typical routine alternation among parties and leadership that you see in many nations, not just in the Americas, but elsewhere? Could you share your thoughts on that? This is one of the things that I always want to understand about about Latin America and Canada. So what we used to in Canada is that people get tired of the party in power. They go to the other party. I mean, there's kind of a sense that some change is just routine and a sign that democracy is working. It, what we're seeing in Canada now is fascinating. As with everywhere else we've been talking about, the economic conditions aren't great. I mean, first quarter growth for Canada on the GDP front was just 0.8%. Um, that's the impact of COVID. People are grumpy. Um, but it's happening within a context where people do have normal alternation. And, and so we've seen Justin Trudeau elected as recently as 2021, but with a minority government. And in fact, if you go back 20 years, Canada's only had two majority governments in all that time, seven elections. Um, and Trudeau's first was his only majority. So people are expressing a certain amount of grumpiness. And it's forced Trudeau to have a coalition with the uh, a soft coalition. Uh, they call it a supply agreement with the New Democratic Party, which is a party of the center left Social Democratic Party, just to stay in power through the next expected election in 2025. But but people aren't voting for the conservatives because they're going through another leadership campaign. They're constantly looking for new leaders. But you wouldn't say it's a crisis of democracy. You would say it's a crisis of, uh, if anything, the political party's not doing well and people looking for another candidate to put in power. So what interests me really is, is this just what we're seeing in places like Mexico, uh, Colombia, and elsewhere, or are we seeing more of a threat to the democratic sort of order as people look for alternatives to democracy itself? What do you think, Cindy, Benjamin, Leila? Thoughts on Ben or on uh, Chris's question? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say I think you know you hear a lot about a crisis of representation, the idea that traditional political parties and democratic institutions are not representing voters sufficiently to maintain support in democracy and in these political systems. I guess I would point to one upside, which is when bitter political rivals are competing with one another, we've seen a lot of examples of very peaceful, orderly transfers of power. When one wins and the other loses, we saw it in Uruguay and Argentina and Honduras, now in Colombia, where you know the president elect and Alvaro Uribe you know, his arch rival came together and tweeted a happy photo of them speaking recently. I think that's really positive. And as we know, in the United States, it's not something to be taken for granted. Yeah, that's for sure. And Cindy, that leads me to, well, let me see if you have a general thought on this first, and then I have a question for you. I, I have one thing to add to the um, extraordinary fact of, of Gustavo Petro's election um, as a man of the left. And I don't want to leave people with the impression that he is not a known face. He's a very well-known face. Um, but there was the, the, the sense that the anti-Petro vote would be so strong that he would be prevented from winning the presidency. And that tr turned out not to be the case. And one of the reasons for that was the very also historic fact of his vice presidential candidate, now vice president-elect Francia Marquez, an Afro-Colombian woman who had been a maid, who had been an artisanal miner, who had been a farmer of subsistence crops, um, who really mobilized the vote in what Colombians refer to as the territories in um, rural areas of the country that have suffered the brunt, not only of the internal armed conflict that officially was brought to an end by the peace accord, um, but, you know, have never really been connected to the national political life of the country. And and Francia's um, uh, existence on the ticket was a huge factor that turned out the vote in areas um, of the countryside that uh, traditionally have been marginalized in national politics. Leela, you know, you, since you're new to the, the panel, I... I need to tell you, one of the dynamics is we can always count on Benjamin Gadan to find the silver lining in the dark clouds. It's one of his strengths as a contributor, which forces me into the Dr. Doom role uh, as a, a counterweight. And what I'm thinking of now is um, Brazil, right? And Bolsonaro has already said things that suggest perhaps that, you know, it's going to be some Trumpian-like denial of the outcome of the election if he were to lose which might be the end of this streak, this positive streak that Benjamin has described. Your thoughts on on anticipation of what we might see in Brazil. Leela, if you want to begin, sure, let's start with you. 
Well, I'll give you kind of uh, my take from from a Mexico perspective, right? Where's where I'm I'm sitting uh, most of the time. So I think we're we're seeing kind of a tendency towards the left in in the Latin American region, and I'll I'll let Benjamin and um, Cindy kind of talk about this a little more. But I I think that what Amlo is doing is that he's really betting that these new leftist populist leaders, um, some are from the right, but the majority are from the left, um, that he can become a leader in the region of of somewhat of I think he's thinking that a new Alba could come to life um, and that he could be the head of it. And so I think that he's his support for Petro in Colombia, his support for Lula in Brazil, this alliance, the strategic alliance in terms of uh, diplomatic relations that he's established with Fernandez in Argentina, but also his, um, you know, his proximity with Luis Arce in Bolivia um, and his support for Cuba, Nicaragua and Venezuela. I think he's really trying to construct or create a leftist bloc that he can lead. And so I think that the elections, the presidential elections in Brazil are definitely going to be a defining moment for the whole region. Benjamin, will we run out of luck in in Brazil? I I mean, I think there's some really ominous signs. Even I have to acknowledge that um, where there's been efforts to delegitimize the independent electoral authorities. There's been, you know, a lot of actions that are eerily familiar to what was seen in the United States leading up to January 6th. Um, which has been, you know, prominently in the news due to congressional investigations. I don't think it's inevitable, and there are there is certainly the possibility that the margin of victory will be so large that it can avoid any kind of dispute afterward, um, and and it could avo- avoid an interruption in this trend. I should note that the last Peruvian election also had a dicey aftermath, where there were disputes about the legitimacy mm-hmm. of the vote, although it ultimately was peacefully um, resolved. So yes, I think it is possible, and I think as early as possible, we should acknowledge that risk, and the international community should be making sure sure that the electoral authorities are given the support they need. Chris, has uh, is Canada seemingly immune to some of these kind of populist waves that have led to insane conspiracy theories and other unsubstantiated claims? Is there something about the system in Canada that is make it makes it more resistant to that type of politics? Well, it's true, John, that maple syrup makes everything sweeter. But um, (laughs) as we saw with the Canadian truck driver protests, um, and they're coming back. This is Canada Day weekend coming up as we record this. And they're making another uh, sort of drive through Ottawa. So we have seen that. And it leads me to kind of ask a question maybe of of the panel again, which is, is it political parties that are going through a crisis, not so much democracy? Because we've certainly seen the weakness in Canadian parties and uh, and I think arguably American parties as well. Um, I, and I know, Cindy, you, you've looked at this. Let me throw this to you first, not to usurp your role, John. No, that's a terrific question, Chris. Sure. Well, parties are really held in low esteem, I think, throughout Latin America. Um, When you look at the surveys that ask people to rank the institutions that they trust or that they respect, political parties are usually at the bottom. Um, Towards the top are things like the church, the armed forces, um, but rarely do political parties um, gain uh, gain support. And and that shows that like this extreme volatility of politics, where there are these new coalitions that form oftentimes around a particular individual, as we've seen in the in the Peruvian case. Um, but, you know, just to go back, though, to something that Lila was commenting on, I think it's really important to distinguish between the different kinds of left in Latin America. Um, there certainly is a turn to the left, partially because the pe- the incumbents that have been thrown out in this wave of discontent were to the center right. That was the case in Colombia. It was the case in uh, in in Chile. Um, it has not been the case in Ecuador. It's not been the case in in uh, in Costa Rica. So you know there is the really authoritarian left represented, the hard left represented by Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. There is a populist left that I think characterizes AMLO in Mexico and also Fernandez in Argentina. And then there's something uh, a little bit more in between, kind of more of an institutional left that is represented by Boric in Chile and and Petro um, in uh, in Colombia. Um, And they may not always um, find common cause, and they have various degrees of respect for institutions and, and making coalitions with other existing parties. Um, so, you know, uh, whether there will be increased solidarity among leftist governments, I think we should expect some of that. How effective it will be in getting anything done, I would seriously question. 
Uh, c- certainly, what Cindy, what you described about uh, parties or individuals versus parties would fit the the, the AMLO model that Lila described in Mexico. Uh, Benjamin, yeah, I think I mean Cindy's right. I think there's great diversity on the on the left in Latin America, but I almost think it's a fool's errand to diagnose any ideological trend whatsoever. I just think people are so upset in the region that the political cycles have shrunk. And they're going to be so fast that, you know, before you know it, whoever's elected now may be run out of town. There's threats of impeachment in both Peru and Ecuador at the moment. The Argentines have an election coming up next year, and the ruling party is very likely to be replaced. The same thing in Brazil, it will go in a different direction. But again, I think what we're seeing is just incumbents being run out of town, and the pitchforks are up right now for whoever's in the presidential palace. Boy, that's, that seems to describe uh, uh, elections in most nations on planet Earth, uh, the known universe. Uh, be, before we're, all, we're a little over time, but this is uh, too interesting to leave sitting. So I'm going to go for a quick lightning round versus the maple syrup round. We're going to move quickly. And I just want to ask each of you, uh, what are you going to be watching? You know, upcoming elections as we try to decide, as Benjamin just discussed, are, are we talking about some political trend or are we really talking about just a very unhappy electorate? What are you going to be watching? Uh, Lila, let's start with you. I think in the Mexico Institute, we're going to be monitoring closely uh, the 2024 presidential elections that every 12 years coincide with the U.S. presidential election. So I think it's going to be a really interesting year uh, for both countries and particularly how that's going to be defining, modifying and changing the bilateral relationship, especially if we see uh, the Republicans or Trump back in power and and who's going to be uh, on the other side in Mexico. I think that that's going to be an extraordinary moment. Okay, Cindy. Sure. I'm going to watch how quickly um, the incumbents in the, Colombia and, and Chile are able to assemble durable coalitions to get anything done, either in terms of political reform um, or economic reform. Um, the global economy is sucking the whole world, but the region as well. High food prices, high energy prices. There's no fiscal space for continued spending. Um, Petro particularly wants to dial back on on hydrocarbon permits for new exploration of oil, wants to transition to a green economy. Where is he going to get money? Um, If he wants to pass a tax reform, he's got to unite with other parties. He has a minority in the Congress. So I think that uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to get things done. And I think it's very likely that we'll see new rounds of street protest. Hmm. Benjamin. You know, look, in Latin America, Brazil is always the 800 pound gorilla. And so if, in fact, former President Lula, as we expect, is reelected, how he performs will make a huge difference to see if these kind of coalitions that Cindy and, and Lila had referenced really start forming. If there is kind of a new movement of solidarity and coordination on the Latin American left, it will be almost entirely dependent upon Lula being elected again and, and succeeding. And, you know, that second part is certainly not guaranteed. Yeah, back back to the future with a former president potentially. Chris, you have the th- the final thought on this episode. Well, I think what I'll be looking at is voter turnout. You know, this is one of the things that Canada used to be known for. They had voter turnout in excess of 70, 80 percent every election. But the trends have been bad. We've seen elections with with 40 percent voter turnout, both at the federal and provincial level, which is historic. And I think suggests that as the political parties are struggling, voters are tuning out. And maybe that's the luxury of being a country that's generally uh, happy. Uh, that they can afford to tune out and and say, well, the heck with all of them. But I think it's a bad sign for Canadian democracy and ultimately public policy. And and across the region, if people give up and don't vote, uh, I'll worry about the legitimacy of our all of our systems. Uh, and if Canada is not uh, safe, then nobody can be. I think. Mm. And on that ominous note, I want to thank Cindy, Benjamin, Chris, and Leela for all their insights that shared they shared with you today. And let you know that this episode of America's 360 was produced by Oscar Cruz, Cecily Fascinella, and Zoe Reed, with the assistance of Tomas Michael, Abby McGowan, and Sophia Schuckner. As always, we want to thank all of you for making us sound good, those of you who operate behind the microphone. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's edition of America's 360 and this discussion. And you'll join us again soon for another. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for your time and interest. You have been listening to America's 360, a podcast about the innumerable ties among the nations of the Western Hemisphere. You can subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. To learn more about our programs, please visit WilsonCenter.org. And please join us again next time for another episode of America's 360.